Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. Every year on the Sunday after Easter when this gospel lesson comes up, I find myself feeling sympathetic towards Thomas. As you think about all the apostles and their journeys of faith, part of the reality of the stories as we hear them is how they fumble and they trip up so many times. Yet out of all the apostles with all their foibles, Thomas is the only one that gets this derogatory nickname, Doubting Thomas. We don't say denying Peter, betraying Judas, but poor Thomas, right? But I think there's a reason for it. I think out of all the foibles and all the mistakes that we hear that these apostles make along the way as they serve with Jesus, as they go on to become the foundation of the church and its growth in the times after the resurrection, it's Thomas and Thomas's struggle that we relate to the most. Doubt is a constant part of our lives in and outside of the faith. We don't often get opportunities to deny Jesus like Peter did or to betray Jesus like Judas did. But those questions about our faith and the reality of it are a daily struggle. Are they not? I mean, that's just part of the journey. It's part of our growth. It's part of living in the trust of God. And it's one of the big reasons why the grace of God is so important and so powerful in our lives. So Thomas, I think, had a very natural reaction to everything that had gone on. I think if we were in Thomas's place, even though we might, in hindsight now, look down upon him and, yeah, down in Thomas, he should have known better. But in reality, if we had been there, if we had experienced that time before Jesus was put on the cross, if we had an opportunity to see Jesus dying on the cross, I think at that moment, later, a few days later, in the evening, when they're in the upper room, if somebody had come to us and said, so-and-so, who we love, who we saw agony, agonize, and die, was now alive, I think each of us might react the same way. No way. That can't be possible. I can't believe it until I see it. Otherwise, I won't accept it. As I was thinking about this this week, it brought me back to the time after September 11th. When I was down at St. John's in Sandal, I had a, a fireman from Rescue One who was killed when the second tower went down. But we did not do a funeral for him for almost a month. 
month after the event. And one of the reasons was, is even though he hadn't come home, even though everyone was pretty sure he was dead, there were no remains. The family was looking for that closure. They were waiting and hoping each day that they would get some sort of confirmation, some sort of physical evidence that he indeed had died. We waited and we waited and we waited and nothing came. Finally, in order to bring some closure to the family and especially the two little girls, as we move forward with the funeral, what we did is end up taking a casket and filling the casket with that person's personal memorabilia, with his uniform, with pictures, with notes, and all other things, so that that ceremony of closure, which is so important for us as we go through the process of mourning, could take place. So we buried a casket not filled with his body, but filled with memories and other objects that represented him. That's how powerful that reality is, how powerful it is seeing and believing and trusting. That's why the funeral process is so important for us. It helps us accept the reality. So now reverse that situation and look at it from Thomas's point of view. He had seen the body that was taken down from the cross. He probably watched them put the body in the tomb. So the death of Jesus was incredibly real to him. But to just hear that he was risen without seeing it was hard because it went against his rational thought and his process of mourning that he was in the midst of going through. And that's why he said, I've got to touch. I've got to see it to believe it. And the grace nugget for us in this story is that Jesus doesn't hold that against him. Jesus gives Thomas what he needs. A week later, when they're in the room again, Jesus shows up and immediately goes to Thomas. Put your hand in my side. Touch the nail marks. Stop doubting. Believe. It's real. You have hope again. You've been. And that for us continues to be what sustains our faith and strengthens us at those times that we have doubt. Because God has given us those witnesses. God has given us the testimony of the apostles, down in Thomas and Peter and Judas and all the others. So that as we gather together as the people of God, as we hear it over and over again, and as God comes to us in the gifts of the church, we can stop doubting but believe. And one of the greatest ways that God touches us on this journey is in the fellowship and the communion that we have with each other. The fact that we're not alone. Thomas wasn't alone in that upper room, and we're not alone here in seeking the resurrected Christ. I had an example of this yesterday. Yesterday I had the opportunity to, to bury a woman. Anne-Marie Batke was her name. She and her family were members here. She raised her children here in the 50s and the early 60s, before I was even born. And yet, during the funeral, we were able to talk about stories. Uh, one story in particular, they remember how after the candlelight service, the midnight service on Christmas Eve, the, the youngest son had fallen asleep and had to be carried out to the car to be taken home. They remember singing in the choir, bowling in the bowling league here at St. Paul's. And you think about that, the generations, this was 50, 60 years ago, that a family's faith and their trust in the power over sin and death, the power of the resurrection was cultivated by God's presence in the family of faith we call St. Paul's. Now multiply that out through the generations, through the centuries, through nearly two millennia. That God's people have been gathering together all across the world, from all different backgrounds, in all different languages, to hear these words. Stop doubting. Believe. That's why John ends this passage with those beautiful words, that reminder to us. Jesus did many other miraculous signs that are not recorded in this book, but these things are written so that you may believe. 
So as we come together as the people of God, in this communion, this family of faith and fellowship that we share, we touch the resurrected Christ in one another so that we can stop doubting and believe.